All right, so we started out here in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're going to get in a passage in just a minute, but I'm just going to give you a little, um, I guess, roadmap, if you will, on what I'll be preaching about this evening. Um, I want to preach just a doctrinal sermon. It's called God's Chosen People. God's Chosen People. So we want to, lots of references to God's chosen people in Scripture, or uh, another word would be elect, chosen, you know, things like that. Elect and chosen basically mean the same thing. You know, we just had elections, so what are you doing? People are choosing a ruler, they're choosing a governor, choosing a, a politician. You know, obviously, um, that's not what I'm talking about, is choosing politicians. Uh, we're talking about God choosing people to be called his people. So who are God's chosen people. What exactly does that mean? Uh, this doctrine, this teaching, this subject actually has, has kind of a lot of ramifications into, into other teachings. And I'm going to try to be careful with the time this evening because I don't want to just take too much, but this is one of those things that could get off into, into lots of different areas. I want to try to keep it focused um, because it is important to know what this is, and hopefully you could just get some good doctrine tonight, and we're going to see just what the Bible has to say about this. We started in Deuteronomy chapter 7, because this is w probably one of the first references of, uh, of God choosing out a people for them and literally just calling them a chosen people. Look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee, to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So this is our first reference to God referring to a people as being a chosen people. They're chosen unto him. Why? It says to be a special people unto himself. So I, I kind of want to investigate, you know, not just who are the chosen people, but what does it mean to be chosen? You know, what are you chosen for? What, 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 is that, what kind of connotations does that carry with it as being one of the chosen people? As well as um, why, why are people chosen of God? You know, what, what is it that would make them different from anybody else? And uh, even when were, were they chosen to be the people of God? All of these things, these factors come into play and uh, with various other doctrines and people who have some bad doctrine will teach some things that will, will really screw things up. So let's just, let's get started here. So we see right off the bat that God has chosen this people, the people of the nation of Israel, uh, to be his people. They were a special people unto himself, above all the people upon the face of the earth. So God chose this people. Verse 7 says, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. Now, just right off the bat, this kind of highlights an attribute of God. God chooses and cares for and loves, you know, the weak things of this world, people who don't have anyone to let God for them. God wants to be their defender. God wants to be that righteous God that's able to step in and help and be there for the helpless, right? He wants to be there for those that have no advocates. He wants to be there as the, the help and the, and the strength and the rock in a time of need for people to turn to and, and be the one there when, when all else would forsake that God is there for the small, for the weak. And he likes to also make himself uh, known and make his power and his might known when he chooses a small person or small people when it's very, very obvious they could not do that on their own. So God's strength is magnified and there's much more glory that goes to the Lord when he's choosing people or using people for whatever purpose it is that don't already have their own strength, their own skills, or, you know, He's not choosing the greatest, mightiest nation on the earth at that time to be his people. Like, wow, you've really excelled, so I'm going to choose you to be my people. That might be a worldly mindset. That might be something that a human being might look to and be like, well, who do I want to have to be my people? I'm going to look for the best. It, it's like the, the 
someone wants to be a sports fan and, they, and they're going to baseball, like, who am I going to choose to be my team? It's like the New York Yankees, right? Because they always buy their teams and, and try to get the best people and they're like, oh, the best team. So people choose. That's, that's the way that a, a, a man would look at it. But see, God looks at it and he's like, okay, who's the worst team? Right? <laughs> he's like, I'm going to choose you to be my team and I'm going to build you up. Right, and then all the glory and glory and honor is going to go to the Lord. And I haven't seen enough baseball in a lot of time, but I could, I could probably fa safely say it's the Cubs. Right, he'd be like a Cubs fan or something. Right? <laughs> I could say that because I was a Cubs fan for a long time, and uh, but I, but I think they did finally win a, a World Series at some point uh, past 1908 or something. Like I said, I, I haven't I haven't been into sports for quite a while, so. I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. I just think of teams that have just always historically just been really bad. And that's like one of the first things that comes to mind. So uh, sorry. Sorry, not sorry. But that's what, what we're seeing here in Scripture, right, to bring it back to the Bible. He says, I didn't choose you because you were more in number than any people. He said, you are actually the fewest amount of people. You are the smallest group. And I chose to love you. And then he says, but in verse 8, but because the Lord loved you, and this is also important, because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So not only were they the fewest in number and God likes to show himself strong, but he's also saying, you know what? I also swore an oath. And when it's talking about their fathers, it's not talking about a nation of people. It's literally talking about individuals. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It started with Abraham, with one man that God made the promise to. God gave this promise unto Abraham. He says, you know, you're going to have a host of, of children, of, 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 of um, descendants, and, and, you know, your seed is going to be blessed, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed. From your seed and all this and we'll get into a little bit of that later but god chooses abraham which then passes on to his son isaac which then passes on to his son jacob this blessing or god continues to to work through these descendants and saying okay here we go and, and he kind of renews his promise with each of those individuals as he uh, as he continues and then he says you know much much time had passed then as they're in egypt and he says, look, I made a promise unto your father, so I'm keeping that promise, which is another one of the reasons why they're chosen and they're special and they're called out and they're sanctified unto the Lord. This is actually going to be extremely important as we continue to look to God's chosen people because today many Christians, if you were to ask them, well, who are God's chosen people? They're saying, Israel, right? Or now Israel would not be a bad answer. I actually agree with that answer, but it depends on what you mean by Israel, yeah, right. okay? It's, it's actually a perfect answer. Right. And again, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We're, we're going to get there. You'll see what I'm talking about in a little bit, but it depends on what you mean. But, but what some people might just say is the Jews. Again, it depends on what you mean, but I, I can't say that I'm going to agree with that answer. <laughs> Because most people, when you say the Jews, is not going to think at all about any other answer than just the people who physically exist right now in the Middle East in the plot of land that's called Israel, right? Whoever it is that's calling themselves the Jews because they think they're of the seed of Abraham physically, that is what most Christians are going to determine to be God's chosen people, okay? Now... There is a little bit of truth to that because originally that's who God chose to be his people, right? So they were the original chosen people in the scripture. But as you can see from Deuteronomy 7, which is pretty early in the Bible, he gives the reasoning as to even why they were chosen. It wasn't by any of their merits. And elsewhere, I forget where the reference is, but when he's giving the law, he also states that, like, look, you guys are actually pretty wicked and stiff-necked and rebellious. You know, when to bring them into the promised land, he's like, I'm not doing, you're not getting all this land and inheriting all this for your sakes. And he refers back to the promise again. 
It's like you, 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 it's not like you are getting all this stuff because you're so great and you're so righteous. He's like, actually, these people were extremely wicked, so I'm judging them, and I made a promise unto your fathers, just similar to what he's saying here. And I, and I don't have the reference. This reference escapes me on, uh, uh, right now. But it's, it's the same concept. It's the same uh, teaching. Now, God's chosen people, I'm just going to state this right now, it does not have to be the same group of people throughout all of time. God's people can change. The Bible says in Psalm 33, and turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to see this illustrated perfectly from Scripture. Psalm 33 verse 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That stands true no matter what time you live in. No matter what nation you live in, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now, let's do the time test on this verse. See if this would still be considered to hold true today for the physical nation of Israel, otherwise known as the Jews. Okay, because that group of people, when the Psalms were penned down, they were under the leadership of King David, a righteous, godly man. They were serving the Lord, right? They were following that. They were, they were, they were interested in actually serving God. And, you know, they were about to build the temple. They were, about, you know, they were kind of, of heading into a great era of service to God. Right? So when this psalm was penned down, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it, it would perfectly describe the nation of Israel at that time. The Jews, for lack of a better term. Hey, the nation whose God is the Lord, they're blessed, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Amen. But if, can anyone honestly stand up today and say, you know what? The nation whose God is the Lord, oh, yeah, that's, that's the Jews. That's physical Israel today. Their God is the Lord. Can anyone say that? And do you really think that they're the people that he hath chosen for his own inheritance? Now, if you read enough scripture, especially in the New Testament, it talks about our inheritance. Right? What, what are we going to inherit? Well, we've inherited eternal life. Right? B believers have. When I say we, I'm talking about believers. Believers of any nation are going to receive an inheritance. And it's not something we've purchased. It's something that God has purchased for us. And if we are his inheritance, now, does it, let me just say this. He's, if he's chosen people for an inheritance, does it make sense that, because I'm talking about our inheritance, but what, this is more talking about God's inheritance, right? Chosen for his own inheritance. Does God have any interest in sending his, an inheritance? Like, does he have an inheritance in hell? Like a whole group of people that don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because where do people who don't believe on Christ go? They go to hell. And we, by and large, there's a nation in the Middle East that's inhabiting the land that the people in the Bible inhabited. But they worshiped the Lord. They believed on the Lord as their Savior right, for their salvation. They trusted in the Lord by and large. Again, not, not everybody by any means, but uh, as a nation, they worshiped and served the Lord. So it makes sense that, hey, you're my inheritance. But what about a people who's rejecting the, the Lord, rejecting Jesus Christ, have one, nothing to do with the Lord? What kind of an inheritance is that? I mean, it's not, that doesn't make any sense that God's going to still look to this people as being his inheritance. Oh, I'm inheriting you. Like, no, no one wants that inheritance. Like, I'm not going to claim that inheritance. I'm going to let that one go by the wayside, right? It's like inheriting debt. I don't want to inherit somebody's debt. There's nothing good about that at all. Now, um, but furthermore, I mean, this is, that was just, you know, kind of almost a side point. First Peter chapter 1, look at, look at what the Bible says here. Because, again, we're talking about what? God's chosen people. So we have Deuteronomy chapter 7. We see God choosing out this people. Because they were small in number and because he made a promise. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 now. 
other extreme as far as where we are in Scripture, right? One, we're very near the very beginning. The other one, now we're near, near the very end of the Bible. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, when the Bible is referring to strangers, what does that word mean? It means foreigners, right? Now, the apostle Peter, was Peter physically a Jew? Yes. Yes, he was. So if he's talking to strangers or foreigners, he's talking to people who are not Jews, right? He's not talking to uh, people. He's talking to strangers who have been scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, all these, um, you know, heathen nations, all these other nations that, that did not serve the Lord. But he's, he's talking to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he says this, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect is another word for chosen, as we just established. And how are they elect? Through sanctification of the Spirit. Now, we all know what that means, okay? Sanctification, your, your spirit set apart. Why? Because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, mm -hmm. So people who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are elect according to 1 Peter chapter 1. Unto, the, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now flip over to chapter 2. I just wanted to show you who is this targeted to. It's targeted to the strangers. It's targeted to the foreigners that are scattered about in all these various countries. Okay, that, That's who this epistle is written to. Already calling them elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Keep that in mind. We'll get back to that a little bit later. The foreknowledge of God the Father. Chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So there's this instruction to these people saying, hey, put aside all that malice, guile, hypocrisies, all these bad things, and desire the sincere milk of God's word. Desire to learn from God's word that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, the context here going into verse 4 is the Lord, uh, to whom the Lord is gracious, to whom coming unto the Lord as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So when we read about the, and this is kind of a big subject, kind of a deep subject, and I don't have time to get into everything tonight, but when we're looking at just specifically the elect, because I'm focusing more on chosen people, chosen elect are very similar, practically the same thing, uh, but when you look at the elect or the election, you're going to have elect referring to a person or a group of people, or the elect referring to one person, the man Jesus Christ, who is God's elect. And the only reason that we are elect is because we're elect through him, who is the elect. And we'll get to that. Under, we'll, we'll, we'll show you that from scripture as well. Um, so here the, the coming unto Christ. Christ is a living stone. Christ was disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That we're reading about here in 1 Peter chapter 2. And then he says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. Again, Jesus being referred to as elect, as the chosen. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Look at verse 9. But ye, so the, the contrast and comparison is between those who believe and those who don't. Those who believe have these blessings and they're these precious stones, but then there's those that don't. And, you know, Christ is a, is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And now he's gone back to talk to the people who do believe in verse 9. But ye are a chosen 
generation. Who is this written to? Strangers in other countries. This wasn't written to Jews in Israel. This was written to strangers in other countries. Ye are a chosen generation. You're a new group of people. You are chosen. This generation, you are now chosen. A royal priesthood and holy nation. So he's not only calling them to say, oh, but that's not calling them a chosen people. That's calling them a chosen generation. Well, then he just calls them a holy nation. A peculiar people. And when you go back to the Old Testament, again, you go back to Deuteronomy, God, want, God is choosing out a people to be a peculiar people unto himself. That's, I mean, it's literally written in the Old Testament that that's what he's doing. He's, he's trying to establish a peculiar people unto himself. And now he's saying, hey, you're a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. You are a royal priesthood. These are a bunch of strangers, foreigners. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, look at this, but are now the people of God. You know what? Before, they weren't considered the people of God. They weren't. Why? Because they, they had nothing to do with the Lord. They weren't serving the Lord. They were for serving idols and false gods and everything else. But now things have changed. But now the disciples have gone out and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you've got groups of people out there, and the word of God is spreading, and the gospel is catching on in various areas, and he's teaching the people here is saying you know what now hey you're a chosen generation now you are a people of God they've become the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy so things have changed so we're talking about people who are chosen people who are elect. it's very very clear from first Peter well, that's definitely not talking about Jews at all. Not in any sense, proven up and down all day long. He is clearly giving all these different names. You are chosen of God. You're a chosen generation. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. And now you're the people of God. How many ways can you say it? I mean, literally, how many ways can you say it? Flip over, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Why does this matter so much? Why, why am I even wasting my time tonight to preach on who are the people, God's people, God's chosen people? It matters a lot. Specifically because there's a lot of people out there who want to elevate one group of people in this world and think that they are a special people that, that all believers ought to be practically worshiping. They're not going to come out and say worship, but they're going to say, I mean, you ought to be blessing them and doing everything for them and praying for them and all, you know, just, just, just elevating this group of people. But the group of people they're talking about reject Christ. In fact, they hate Christ. In many cases, not even just an average unbeliever, but actually hate the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet you're, but, but people want to tell you, well, no, 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 but God chose them. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, God chose them a long time ago. But something happened. Something changed. Other people became the people of God. They weren't before, but now they have become this is what Jesus was talking about, I'll, and I'll read this for you because I know you're already in 2 Thessalonians, so stay there. In Matthew 21, 43, Jesus said this, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to power. Isn't it funny? It's talking about this. It's the same exact thing that Peter's talking about in 1 Peter. The cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, and whoever, you know, if you reject it, it's going to be a rock of offense and a rock of stumbling. 
This is exactly what Jesus said. I mean, where do you think Peter got the teaching from? <laughs> he got it from Christ himself. He got it from the rock himself. The rock who is going to be grinding them to powder. Is, is stating this while he's even on the earth saying, look, kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you. And, and you know who he's talking to? The chief priests and Pharisees? They knew what he was talking about because the next verse says, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Inspiration of the Holy Ghost, my friends, they knew that he was talking about them because he was talking about them. Yeah. And those parables, it's, it's where God's letting, you know, God's got this vineyard. Well, the, the master has this vineyard and he's letting it out to other people to look over it and address it, take care of it. And they're supposed to be sending the boss his money and his due and everything back. And they're not doing anything. They're stealing. They're just doing their own thing. And he's sending his servants to go and collect from them. And they're killing them and beating them and everything else. And then he sends his own son. And they kill his son. And then he's like, well, what do you think that guy's going to do? They're like, well, he, they're gonna, he's going to miserably destroy those wicked servants and let out the vineyard to other people. He's like, that's right. That's exactly what he's going to do. You got it. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Huh. Maybe he's talking about us. Yeah. Because that's exactly what they did. They killed the prophets. And then they killed the son. So what did he do? I'm taking this away from you. You, you are not my chosen people anymore. You are not the nation that I'm going to use to be the lighthouse to the world. You are not going to be the group of people that is going to use my name because you've already abandoned me a long time ago. You've rejected me. You are not my people. And I'm going to look for the nation now that's going to bring forth the fruits. I'm going to look for the nation that wants to serve me. I'm going to look for the, the nation that is looking to me and that I am their God. They will be my people. And that nation will be blessed. And that's what Jesus says, I'm going to take it from you. King of God is going to be taken of you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And that's exactly what he did. Some people go even as far as to think that the Jews, physical descendants of Abraham, somehow get this free pass into heaven. It's crazy. And you know what's evidence? You know how I know that this is true? I can't tell you how many times... I've run into a Jew out soul winning, right? And they tell me, and look, this is different from any other religion of any other person I ever talked to say, oh, well, I'm a Jew. With the expectation of going, oh, you're a Jew? And like changing my behavior or something, as opposed to continuing to try to win them to Christ. And look, I could discern that. I understand body language and how people talk and stuff. I, I kid you not. That is the way that, that it is expressed many, many, many times. And it is not like that with any other person that says, oh, I'm a Muslim. There's no expectation in their voice. There's no expectation in what they're, you know, as, from a response, other than they're saying, that's what I am. Like everybody else who tells you what religion they are. It's, I'm telling you. And you know how else I know it's true? Because even the scripture, John the Baptist said, hey, Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Don't think that that descendancy is going to mean anything for your eternal life because God's able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. He said, that doesn't matter. It means nothing. They thought it meant something back then. Some of them still think it matters today that that's actually going to get them in. And even some so-called Christians think, that that matters. Like, listen to John the Baptist. It boggles my mind. Anyone who's going to call themselves a Baptist is going to think that some Jew is going to have a special ticket into heaven based on their genealogy. Like, open up the Bible and read it, man. Go back to your Baptist heritage and listen to John the Baptist a little bit and see what he's saying to these Jews who think they have a free ticket into heaven, and he's saying, uh, no. Someone's going to hear a sermon like, oh, Pastor Verzen, he hates Jews. No, I don't. I don't. That's why I'm going soul winning and trying to get them saved, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Because I hate them so much? No. But you know what I hate? I hate false doctrine. I hate especially doctrine like that, where people are going to not soul win, are not going to try to reach them with the gospel of Christ, because they think, oh, they're this special chosen people, they're okay. That's actually the most hateful thing you could do for any unbeliever. Right. Yeah. Is just think, that, oh, they're okay, they don't, they don't actually need to hear this. No, they actually do need to hear it. Nobody gets a special pass because God's not racist. That's right. Right. Yep. God didn't choose his people because of their race. God chose people because he made a promise unto one person, and these are his descendants. And then he chooses the people that are going to choose him as their God. That's it. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think is where I had you turn. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to have to skip over, well... We're kind of getting into this area where we, we mix, different doctrines start to get mixed here with the elect, with the chosen people, who are God's people. And I'm going to dabble a little bit into exposing Calvinism for the fraud that it is too because they, the two go hand in hand. And I'm not, this is definitely not going to be a full sermon. Don't worry. It's not going to be a full sermon on all the five points of Calvinism and why it's all messed up and stuff. But they, they do sort of go hand in hand. And the reason why is verses like this. Is I put this in my notes because I'm also not going to, you know, when I preach the word of God, I'm not going to shy away from scripture. We're going to look at everything because it's worth looking at to understand exactly what the Bible is talking about. So just because some people take verses and come up with really bad conclusions to it doesn't mean I'm not going to still look at them and, and talk about them what I'm preaching because, in fact, I'd much rather go over it so that people aren't going to turn your head around with what they're trying to say things like this mean. But when you look at verse 13, again, the Bible says, God hath from the beginning, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So here we see God choosing. So when did God choose, according to this, from the beginning, right? Well, beginning isn't necessarily clear, but we could just, I mean, we could just go all the way back to the beginning of creation, for that matter. That's not a problem unless you're trying to remove free will from people. That's when it becomes a problem. And here's, here's why. You say, what do you mean? If God's already chosen me, then what can I do? Hold on a second. You have to understand who God is, like, outside of our constraints as human beings. And this really does matter. We are bound by time. Everything that we think about has to do with time. Our brains, we're, I mean, we are thinking about beginnings and endings and, and where we are, and we are stuck in time. And God is not. And it's hard to think of anybody not being bound by time. We have ancestors, and they have ancestors, and they have you know, people who have lived before us, and they all had origins they all had beginnings and endings and that's how we know and experience everything what happened in the past is over it's done we can't go back we're still we're always in the present right we can't jump into the future god is not bound like that to god in god's view of us of everything of his whole creation of everyone who ever has existed or will existed it's all just open before him. For us, we are stuck by time, but to God, everything has already happened and nothing has happened yet. Or where it's any point in the middle because he, he's not limited at all. 
people who have lived a thousand years ago, right? Just like we are experiencing life right now, they were experiencing life a thousand years ago that way. But, but to God, it doesn't matter at all. Time doesn't mean anything <laughs> to God. That's why the Bible says a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. And we're going to actually look at that verse too because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. God is, is just outside of time. So the point at which God chooses is irrelevant. It's relevant to us because we're bound by time, but for God, it doesn't even matter. God can say at any time because he knows everything at all times. In the very beginning of creation, God already knows, for example, God already knew that, uh, uh, I forget the exact day in April when, uh, when I was like, you know, 19 years old and I called on the Lord to be saved. Like God knew that from the beginning. Because God know, knew everything, just like he knew that for you, whatever day that you called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul, he knew that. He knew the day that was going to happen. He, he knew that you have already, uh, and to him, it's like you already had done it. In the, in, the, in the time of this world, you might not have been born yet. But in God's view, it was already done. Just like things to come, God writes about them as if they already were, because God knows the beginning from the end. He knows all of it. Because he's seen it all, he knows it all. It's, it's, there's no surprises. But that does, just because God can see everything and knows everything does not imply that he makes you choose what you've chosen. Right. Two different things. The knowing and understanding and all that goes along with it is not the same as forcing you to not have a will of your own. And that is the number one super important key to understand. And that is, you know, one of the, the biggest fails of Calvinism. If you're going to start to say that there's no free will of an individual, now the ramifications of that are enormous. Because the God that you worship is not the God that I worship. One, so what was one little disagreement in doctrine? Who cares? We both believe on Christ, right? No, you are actually believing in a different God. Because the God that I believe in, the most wicked, horrible atrocities that happen in this world that are perpetrated by people, those thoughts are not originating or those acts are not originating with God. They are not. The Bible even says, hey, those things didn't even enter into my mind. But if man did not have free will, they would have had to originate with God. So the two-year-old that gets defiled by an adult if no one has free will, then that would imply that God made that person commit that act. And I'm sorry, that is not God. That is not the God of the Bible. That is the devil. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And it, these, these concepts all float together. But when we understand God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation, but how? Salvation, how? Through sanctification of the Spirit. That's how we were chosen because it's through that sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Right? We got saved. So, so God chose us, but the process was still us believing, but he didn't force us to believe. He knew we were going to do it. So we're chosen because we believed. Everyone who has put their faith in Christ is chosen of God. And because God knew you would believe, he's chosen you.
Verse 14 says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Flip over, if you would, to Romans 10. I'm trying to determine now. I'm looking at my time. Mm. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip the last part that I have in my notes here. There's just not enough time to get to it. I figured that might happen. I'm starting in Romans 10. Really, the, the meat is going to be in Romans 11, but I want to get the context going into Romans 11 from Romans 10. So we're going to start with verse 16 in Romans 10. The Bible says, But they have not all believed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now, Romans 10 is definitely talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You can read the whole chapter earlier in the context. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All this stuff, right? And then he's, then he's kind of concluding here, like, well, didn't, didn't Israel know? Uh, yeah, Israel did know because now he's going back to Moses. You know, the question is, did not Israel know? Of course Israel knew because Moses said, like, of all people who should know what Moses said, Israel, of course Israel knew. First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. Prophesying of the events to come that the Apostle Paul is living right then and there. Provoking the physical seed by those people who are not a people. They're not called, they were not the, the people of God. Now they're going to become jealous because God is choosing them and is replacing Israel. So now they're going to be jealous. Oh, what do you, you, who do you think you are? You're not the, you're not the people of God. Oh, uh, yes, we are. And then Israel gets jealous. Verse 20, But Zias is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith. So uh, the, the contrast here between the, the other nation, but then to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So this is setting the stage for chapter 11 about the disobedient, gainsaying people being Israel, right? Verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? I mean, they knew this because Moses talked about it. You know, faith cometh by hearing, and, and, and obviously they're not receiving, and he's saying Israel is disobedient and gainsaying. So with all this in mind, he's saying, well, I mean, did God just cast away his people then? Like, is God just, just done, and his people are just completely gone and thrown in the trash? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's talking about being of Israel here. He's clearly talking about physically because he's talking about what tribe he's from and everything else. God hasn't cast away like the physical seed of Abraham from being the people of God. He said, God forbid, because, hey, look, I'm one of them, right? And I'm saved. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew, what ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So he brings up the story of Elijah, and Elijah is feeling like, man, there's nobody left. And God tells him, hey, don't worry, you know, there's actually 7,000 people. You're not all alone, right? You're not just completely the only person left that's a worshiper of the Lord. There are other people. So now he's using that story to say in verse 5, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Why? Because there are physical Jews, seed of Abraham of various tribes, that believed on Jesus Christ and were saved by grace. So there's still other people out there. It's not just the Apostle Paul. 
right? There's other people who also physically descended, and they're saved, which means that, you know, they were according to the election of grace, so they're still elect, right? They're not cast away. They're still elect because of the election of grace. And then he goes on, and if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more. Great verse. Highlight that one. Save it for later. Verse 7. What then? And, and th this says it all for people who want to say Israel, physical Israel, because that's who he's talking about, are the chosen people. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Okay, regardless of what that is, whatever they're seeking for, it doesn't even matter for what this verse is going to teach us about what I'm teaching tonight. Israel hath not obtained it, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So it's talking about Israel being a different group of people from the election. And very clearly in context, this Israel is talking about is a physical seed. Because he's talking about just earlier, him being a physical, you know, Israelite and of the seed of, of Benjamin and everything else. So let's keep reading here. Verse 8, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Uh, flip over, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. And I'll, I'll close with Galatians chapter 3. I'll have to go into predestination another day. That was, that's going to be my last points, was covering the, the we, we covered it enough, though, when, when we talked about that uh, free will and everything. That, that it all goes hand in hand. Galatians chapter 3, and this is, this is one of my favorite passages, just anytime anyone wants to talk about Israel, it's just, I mean, it's, it's just as good as where we just were in Romans 11. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 6. And when I say good, it's because it's really clear. Like, this is irrefutable. It's irrefutable. And I decided to, to make this a sermon for another day, but I, I was going to get into this a little bit, but I'm going to preach a sermon on, on how to discern what's true and what's not true. I mean, you hear different teachings, hear different doctrines and stuff. Whatever is lining up with what the Bible is actually saying is true. Just, just a little precursor to that next sermon I'm going to preach. Okay? And when you can just see statements like, okay, you've got Israel and you've got the election. What do you say against that? How could you say that they're not two different things when they clearly are? At that point, it's like, if someone's going to try to refute that, I'm just going to say, I'm done talking to you. Because you refuse to accept what the Bible just says on its face. And I don't even want to talk to you anymore. And people will try to come up. And if, if, people have to, if you have to come up with some weird, roundabout, twisty answer to try to give an explanation for Scripture, you've got it wrong. you got it wrong. Galatians 3, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So who is the child of Abraham? According In this passage here, in this context, those who are of faith. Who are the chosen people of God? Well, they were the ones that God had promised to Abraham that they were going to be his people. They were children of promise, just like Isaac was a child of promise. All throughout the Bible, it's never really been about your genealogy, ever. Ever. Now, there were rules about the priesthood and your genealogy. Yes, there were. There were rules about that in the service of, like, the Levitical priesthood. But not about your salvation. It never was about your salvation. That's why there was one law for the land that applied evenly to everybody. God's law applies equally. Whether you're, whether you're 
a native born in the land or a stranger that's come in to sojourn, law of God, apply, law of God applies the same directly. They which are faith. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8, Galatians 3. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. More reinforcement that Abraham was saved by faith. He's called faithful Abraham. And the gospel that was preached to Abraham was a gospel of faith. Which is why those of his, the people who are be called his descendants are doing, you know, the works of Abraham, so to speak. They're his children because they are children of faith because Abraham faith, had faith. So if they have faith, they're children of Abraham. And this is what even Jesus was trying to explain to the Pharisees. Hey, you're of your father, the devil, That's right? Because right? you do the works of your father. Hey, if you were of Abraham, you wouldn't go about trying to kill me. If you were of Abraham, you'd have faith like Abraham. I mean, Abraham, what, what is the number one thing he's known for? It's his faith. Look at Hebrews 11. Look at the Bible. I mean, look through Genesis. Look, look here in Galatians. He's known for his faith. He's known because when he was called out to go into a country they didn't know, he did it. He had no idea. He was all alone. God just said, hey, I need you to go, and he did it. And he was known as a friend of God. Let's jump down to verse number 16. Here's a famous 316. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. So those promises that God made, the, the whole point was that they were made to about Christ. Because he was the seed that he was chosen to be the line that ultimately Jesus Christ was going to be born through. And we all get to share in the blessings through Christ, through that heir. Let's keep reading. Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So he's saying the promise supersedes the law. So no matter what the law says, it can't touch the promise. Which is why, for those of you who are of faith, the law has no more effect on you. You're saved regardless. We're free from the law because the law cannot disannul the promise. We are receiving the blessings. We're receiving of the promise through faith. That law has no more effect on you. It cannot disannul, it can't make it void, that it should make the promise of none effect. Verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? So why do we even have the law then? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, of course, which is Christ, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now jump down to verse 28, we're going to close on this. And we know also the law is a schoolmaster. It's meant to point us to Christ. It's point us to know that we're not perfect. We need, and we need to put our faith in Christ. That's the, the, the purpose of the law is to, is to show us our need for a Savior. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. And this is not some isolated teaching, by the way. I mean, this is all throughout the New Testament. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So who are the chosen of God? Is it the physical seed of Abraham? No. It's Abraham's seed by faith. It's those that have faith with faithful Abraham. It's those that are heirs according to the promise, those that have an inheritance according to the promise because you're born again, because you're saved, because you're put your faith. You are the chosen 
of God. You know, that ought to make you feel pretty good, too, by the way. God did choose you. And he didn't make you believe, but because he knew you were going to believe, he chose you. And that's cool. And, and you know what? He chose you individually. Every single one, individually, knowing you personally, you're chosen of God. That's great. It's not because where you were physically born. It's not because of who your ancestor was. It's because you humbled yourself and accepted Christ as your Savior. And God likes that. God likes the humility. God likes people who are willing to admit they need a Savior. They need help. They need someone. God likes that, and he chooses and says, yeah, I'm going to choose you. So what he did with the people of God from the beginning, I'm going to choose the weak, the, the small, the... God chose you. Can't do any of it on our own. Thank God that he chose it. And you know what? Now he's there for you. And he's never going to leave you or forsake you. Amen. Amen. So our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for choosing us, for not for any of our own merits or righteousness, dear Lord. Oh, what a foolish thought that would be. But we thank you for loving us and, and loving us first and dying for us and for... Um, saving us dear lord and i pray that you would please help us to never think that that anyone uh, doesn't need salvation apart from just understanding if, if people are professing faith obviously uh, then they already have it dear lord but but i pray that you please help us to um, never place one group of people ab above another for any reason at all dear lord but that we would be able to to treat everyone equally in the sense that uh hey everyone everyone needs to be saved Everyone needs a Savior, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to, um, to reach all uh, with the Word of God. I pray that you please soften up the hearts of this, this world. I pray that you please help us to reach as many people as we possibly can with the truth. Thank you so much for being our God and, uh, and for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.